So Secure Trust Bank has been going since 1952. We're headquartered in Solihull in the West Midlands. And the bank actually started out as a household budgeting service, helping customers to smooth the payments over the year for the, the bills that came in. We've developed quite a lot. We actually had our first uh, listing on the stock market in 2011. So 11 years now that we've been on the market and went on to the main market in 2016. Although we're headquartered in Solihull, we also have offices in Birmingham, Cardiff, London, Reading, Leeds and Manchester. Today, we are a very different business, much more diverse, and we describe ourselves as a specialist lending business. Our core purpose has been defined to be there to help consumers and businesses fulfill their ambitions. And we also have a new defined vision to be the, the most trusted specialist lender in the UK. We're also a fully regulated bank, so we take customer deposits, look after their savings for them, and pay them interest as a reward. And we use that money to lend to customers with a borrowing need. We've also got a very good reputation for prudent risk management. So in the uncertain times that we're currently facing, that will stand us in very good stead. We've got four attractive specialist business units, and these actually operate across both consumer banking and business finance. The first one is retail finance, a business called V12 Retail Finance, which is headquartered in Cardiff. So there we're actually providing point of sale finance in shops and online uh, for retailers to actually give credit to customers to buy a whole range of consumer goods. So jewellery and furniture being a predominant categories that we support. We actually serve over 1,200 retailers. We integrate into their till systems so we can give instant decisions. And we're actually known for our ease of integration with our technology. That's a business where we process over 100,000 applications every month, full automated decisions and digital signatures. Um, and we've got real strong growth prospects there. We actually compete against the likes of Barclays Partner Finance, BNP Paribas, and uh, Hitachi Credit. We see great opportunity for further growth. And in fact, we're going to be extending the proposition further in the early part of next year. We bought a business called Aptipay, which is a digital buy now, pay later capability, which will allow us to serve lower ticket purchases over a shorter duration, offering interest-free credit. The interesting thing here is that uh, it is predominantly interest-free credit and it's low risk, prime credit quality customers that we're lending to. The business model works by retailers paying us a subsidy for us providing credit to their customers. And also they price the cost of that subsidy into their retail purchase product. Um, so there's a lot to go after. We've really de risked the profile of the customer base here in the last few years. And we think the extension into digital buy now, pay later proposition will continue to do that. And it has about a third of our lending balances uh, the half year 2022 we're in this business. The next division is second-hand car finance. So we don't finance any new purchase cars, only second-hand. So what we do there is we actually operate with a range of dealers. So we have a direct sales team going out, signing up dealers to offer our finance. We also have brokers that we work with who operate a panel of lenders. Um, so anyone who's going to a, a used car dealership and looking to purchase a car will apply for credit if they're not a cash buyer and our proposition will be part of the offer that's available to them. Again, similar to retail finance, uh, you know, a very automated process, all integrated easily into the dealership, uh, the broker's uh, systems. So we can provide instant decisions. We can provide digital signature uh, executed agreements so the customer can walk away with a full knowledge that they're approved and can get that car there and then. We're competing in this business against the likes of uh, Close Brothers, Moto Novo, Startline, and Blue Motor Finance. Um, not really seeing any much change in the competitive dynamics there. And the business represents about 12% of our lending at the half year in 2022. But it's a business that we've invested quite a lot of money for a business our scale in new technology and new platforms in recent times. So we now offer not just near prime, which is our heritage lending portfolio, but also prime credit quality lending as well. So we've really widened the customer base that we can serve. So we're now able to actually help dealers to fund cars, buy, sell, and finance their sales of used cars. So really from you know, a one-stop shop, if you like, from a lending solutions perspective. So it's a business that having invested quite heavily, we're looking to scale up, and we saw strong growth in the first half of 2022. There's very different dynamics across these businesses, and in a rising rate environment, we've obviously had to start passing through increases to customers. What happens in consumer finance is, you don't change the interest rate that the customer is charged if they're already lent to, but what you do do is put your prices up, 
when there's a new agreement put in place. So progressively through this year, we have actually been putting up prices as interest rate environment has increased. And um, there's a little bit of a time lag of that feeding through into our margin. Um, for example, if you buy a sofa, it might take three, four months to be delivered, but we agreed a price at the time with the retailer for you to get your interest fee credit. So that still sticks and it takes a little bit of time for that pipeline to work its way through. But as you get to a flatter yield curve, which looks like it'll be into middle of 2023, you'll start to see our margins stabilise. In fact, our margins have remained fairly stable uh, since the half year. So now if we move on to the business finance area, we've got two businesses. The first one is called real estate finance. I mean, essentially what we're doing here is providing finance solutions to professional property investors and developers. So these are not individuals owning one or two buy-to-let properties. These would be investors owning you know, a block of apartments with 18 units within it. And what they're doing is managing occupancy levels and yield to generate income. Against residential uh, investment properties, we typically lend up to five years. And on development portfolio, we lend for new build up to three years. We've got a very low risk appetite, so we don't go above 70% loan to value. And as a result, the loan to value of the book on average is below 60%. There's very different uh, considerations here. It's all fully secured. Um, as a result, you have lower margins than we'd have on the consumer side, where in vehicle finance you've got some security, but retail finance is purely unsecured. We've got some pretty sophisticated customers, um, and the typical new size of a, a transaction will be above £5 million. So just to give some sense that these are quite complex uh, transactions. Um, and we've got a very good uh, experience of managing these exposures. And actually, since we started this business seven, eight years ago, we've actually had no losses. So in the real estate finance portfolio, it represents 42% of our lending at the half year. Interesting mix in the portfolio. It's predominantly now residential investment is about close to 90% actually of our lending. Um, and although we uh, have got some commercial lending, it's a very low proportion of total lending, single digit percentages. And then our fourth specialist lending business we call commercial finance. But here we're providing working capital support to small businesses um, who have the benefit of asset-based security. Principally, we're lending against the receivables in that business. Our customers include you know, manufacturers of small parts to go into motor vehicles. Um, we've got uh, food manufacturers and processors. So ultimately, the people we're really lending against are their customers. So it typically tends to be large motor vehicle manufacturers, uh, the large supermarkets, for example. And ultimately, that's the debtor that we are providing the facility against. What we do is typically lend up to 90% of an invoice value so that the customer can get earlier drawdown of that cash before having to wait for the payment terms to be paid by their customer, which provides them the money to you know, support wages, invest in more raw materials, you know, invest in property or invest in plant and machinery. So really just core working capital support for those businesses. Again, it's a business where you've got all that security and the receivables. The team are very adept at managing upfront what are our different exit routes. If there's a need to uh, you know, come out of the support. Um, but again, we've had minimal losses over the seven, eight years that that business has been operational. It's based in Manchester with some satellite offices and led by a very capable team of market experts. And these individuals really understand the market they operate in, where to win business and how to compete against their competitors. Just to give an example of the security that is in place. So, you know, in current times and the uncertainties, we have had a couple of customers who have had to unfortunately go into administration through the course of this year. But with the security and the structure of the transactions that we've had in place, we've been able to uh, close out uh, without any uh, credit losses. So this is something that the team gave a lot of thought to, as I say, up front, and it's been proven to stand us in good stead this year. We also have some strong relationships with a number of you know, smaller private equity uh, businesses who introduce us to their portfolio companies they're investing in, who are also looking for working capital support. And so we've got a steady stream of those opportunities coming to us. So in the current rising rate environment through 2022, in the business finance areas, both of them, we actually pretty quickly just passed that straight through to our existing customers as well as new customers. So uh, progressively, as we've gone from a base rate of 0.1% in December 2021 uh, to 3% currently, then we've just been passing that through and it happens within a month automatically. So uh, we are protecting margin as interest rates rise. So I've been CEO now for approaching two years. Um, However, prior to that, I actually had a year on the board as a non-executive director. 
So that gave me an invaluable insight to be able to meet the team, understand the business and some of the dynamics and pressures that they were facing, and also to clarify my own view, some opportunities going forward. So it was quite clear to me that we needed to build on strong foundations, which were clearly there, but also uh, make some change. So we have had a process of refreshing the management team. We've also made a much clearer definition and articulation of our strategy and given clarity on where we're going, both internally to colleagues, but also to the wider market. I think the other thing to say is that the business actually had eight businesses when I became CEO. So we have actually gone through a simplification exercise. So there were four businesses that were either subscale, no longer products available for new customers, that really had very low growth prospects. Um, and my view was that these were actually taking up quite a bit of time and effort, um, and we need to refocus where we really had strong opportunities for growth. So that's what we did. Um, you know, we've made significant progress. We're now a much clearer, focused organisation, know where we're going, and have communicated what we're doing. The other thing to say, of course, is taking up the role during a pandemic was not without its challenges. But the colleagues in the business responded brilliantly, actually, to that uh, challenging time. We made it very clear we wanted to support our existing customers and not just chase new business. So we were there, our colleagues were there to support the customers and the relationships that already existed. Um, we simplified the business, as I mentioned, and actually set the path for significant growth in the future. So now that we've set out a clearer vision, purpose and strategy, we have got something that binds all the businesses together. Because although they're very diverse and are serving different target audiences, they all are here to help, whether it's consumers or businesses, fulfil their ambitions. So we have set out the stall of where our growth trajectory is going to be in each of them. Um, the other thing we focused on was looking at the opportunity for internal uh, efficiency improvements. We established a programme called Project Fusion, which is looking across the business and our cost base and where we incur spend. So we've been looking at supplier contracts. You know, We've had examples of maybe th three different parts of the group using the same supplier and not leveraging the capability of the group to buy and scale. Um, we've got surplus properties that we can rationalise. Um, we've got operating model changes we can make. One of the bigger opportunities, though, was actually on how we digitise more of our manual processes. And we're actually at different stages of maturity across our consumer businesses here. In retail finance, actually, the team did a fantastic job through the pandemic, focusing on actually how they could automate more of the self-service capability our customers would like to use. So customers, rather than having to phone us, we register for our online banking capability and self-serve if they wanted a balance check or to make a payment. So a lot of the automation there has been done. In vehicle finance, you know, we're coming towards the end of a £14 million investment. Um, we've got a couple of million pounds of that still to spend. But that has all been about digitising and automating more of our processes and customer journeys. We still also have plans to introduce a mobile banking app for the first time for our savings products. So today, it's quite a manual process if you want to uh, make changes to your account, check a balance or move money. We actually want to make and take some of the learning from the other business units, make that a much more seamless process, uh, digitise it so customers can self-serve on an app. So these activities have been driving cost efficiencies, but will continue to do so as we roll out more of them. Well, we held our first Capital Markets Day in November 2021, and that's where we first set out to the market a uh, much clearer vision, purpose and strategy, and also had the business unit management teams present on how they supported that uh, core purpose. We set out five medium-term targets, and the first one was that we will deliver a return on average equity of between 14 and 16% in the medium term. Now, we're not quite at that level yet, but we are very confident with the growth rates we're delivering, the income that will generate, and our cost efficiency initiatives, that's the level of return that we'll deliver for shareholders in the medium term. We also set out a cost-income ratio, which at the time was around 60%, would go below 50%. So really that's starting to pick up on the efficiency improvements we're making, trying to hold those costs steady as the top line growth in lending and income grows. So we're very confident in our ability to uh, improve the cost-income ratio. That's already been demonstrated in the first half of this year, and we will, as we scale, get that below 50%. We also highlighted that our net interest margin would always remain above 5.5%. Now, we are above that currently, but we are confident it will continue to be above 5.5% in the medium term. There's also a change in mix going on in our book. We've improved the lending profile, moved into prime lending and motor finance, do more interest-free credit, prime lending and retail finance. And so as a result, you would expect that the margin should reduce 
because the cost of risk would also reduce. But we think it's appropriate for a specialist lending business uh, in the segments that we're in and the markets we are serving to always remain above 5.5%. We are not like another bank with a very large uh, mortgage portfolio, which typically has much lower margins below 2%. We also set out a target to maintain our CT1 ratio, a capital ratio above 12%. Now, we've got strong capital position uh, to fuel the growth trajectory that we're on, um, but we will consume that capital as we grow the business, but that will remain above 12%. And then finally, the last target we set out at the Capital Markets Day was to grow our lending book by 15% per annum. Now, what we did say at the time was that uh, there would be periods of time where it would be appropriate to grow at that level and periods of time where we should be more cautious. Clearly, 2022, um, and the second half of it in particular, is a time where we are being more prudent. So we would be willing to accept that we don't hit the 15% average growth rate in our lending book and protect the other medium-term targets um, in this current environment. And through the course of this year, we've been tightening up our lending criteria. Um, we grew by 12%, just over 12% in the first half of the year but we have signalled that we will constrain growth during the second half of 2022 and likely into the first part of 2023. We also uh, set out last year a new dividend policy. We reinstated dividend after COVID. We remained profitable throughout the COVID uh, period and the challenges that, that presented. But 25% is really to reflect the fact we're a growth business, a growth stock and plenty of lending opportunity ahead of us. So that's why we've given a stable 25% policy to the market. So just to summarise where we are currently, we've gone through that first phase where there was a simplification of the group to be done, you know, challenging times through COVID to be managed, refresh of the management team and simplification of the group. Uh, now with a much clearer vision, purpose and strategy. We've then started to deliver against that. So each of our specialist lending businesses delivered growth in the first half of 2022, all of them double digit growth with the exception of real estate finance which clearly is the largest single part of our lending and therefore growing at the same level is harder. But in aggregate, 12% growth in that first half. We will continue to grow through the second half of this year, um, but at a more muted level given the market uncertainties. Looking ahead, uh, as we continue to drive the operational efficiencies through digitization um, and other uh, opportunities in front of us, then we will continue to invest in the customer proposition, look to launch new products and digitize more of our processes. That is really what gives us the confidence and the line of sight on these initiatives that we'll be able to drive top line growth and maintain cost efficiency and deliver that cost income ratio target of below 50% in the medium term. Looking further ahead, uh, there are clearly opportunities for us to consider not just the organic growth plans that we've got, but potentially to supplement those with inorganic opportunities. I mentioned earlier, we'd bought the small startup uh, business app to pay which we'll launch a product under in the first half of next year. But there may be some others or even portfolio sales that might be available to us. I mean, we do expect a number of the non-bank lenders in a more normalised rate environment will come under pressure. Um, and so being a bank and access to retail deposits gives us an advantage to consider potentially looking to acquire portfolios as well. Beyond that, it's a case of just making sure we do get on with delivering those medium term targets. Um, you know, it's a, a growth stock, as I say, uh, plenty of opportunities ahead of us. We're clear on what we're doing now and also what we're no longer doing. And the team is right behind using their expertise and their capabilities and special specialism uh, to deliver on all those targets.